<laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Ben Wright here, still in Cyprus, still soaking up the raids, and I will be joined by Michael Vaughan and Phil Tufnell, who are back in the UK. England's white ball cricketers continue to struggle. Their latest defeat came in the form of a 90-run defeat to South Africa in the T20 to grant the visitors a 2-1 series win. We were sympathetic to the new captain, Josh Butler, last week, but both he and the head coach, Matthew Mott, admitted after that match that honest conversations need to be had if the team's form is to be turned around before the T20 World Cup later this year. England's women, thankfully, have no such concerns. They made it through their summer schedule undefeated, and they're taking that good form into the Commonwealth Games, which are currently underway in Birmingham. Delighted to say that one of the stars of that team, Sophia Dunkley, is our guest today. We'll get her take on the Commonwealth Games, the future of Test cricket for female cricketers, and the return of the 100, which is back on Wednesday. I'll also get the guys' thoughts on the return of the 100. Can it build on its impressive debut last year? And this week, we'll also be giving you a chance to have a free hit at Phil Tufnell. Good luck, Phil. All right, hello, chaps. I'm still on my holiday. I'm still in Cyprus. You're in not-so-sunny England. Mike, you're being rained on, I hear. Yeah, there's floods up north. It's ridiculous. I mean, you, you book your golf medal at quarter past. I've driven from Bristol this morning where it's lovely, and I've got them. Not, the golf course is shut. Oh, the M60 oh. nearby Manchester is chock a blocker. There's floods everywhere. Well, it's gorgeous really? down south. It's gorgeous down south, Mike, still. I can't believe it. Cannot believe it. Uh, I, haven't seen a, I haven't seen a cloud for eight days, I don't think. Beautiful. Love love a bit of Cyprus. Uh, the only problem is it's getting too hot. The pool is now 31 degrees. It's almost like a bath. Oh, dear. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right, guys, confession time. Did you watch England playing their last T20 against South Africa in Southampton? Or did you watch the Lionesses vanquishing Germany at Wembley? I watched the Lionesses vanquishing Germany at Wembley and it was fabulous. What a great afternoon. Went round my mate's house, got the bunting out and the flags and it was great. I thought I thought the standard was great. I thought the fitness was great. I thought the skills was great and it was edge of your seat stuff. We were roaring them on and what a finish just at the end. Brilliant. Absolutely delighted for them. Ben, I, I shouldn't admit to it on a, on a cricket podcast, but... I didn't even know England cricket were playing on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know they were wow. playing in Southampton. I was that group with the Formula One to start with, and then obviously the Lionesses. We did the same as Phil went to a mate's house. Uh, oh, it was, we had kids there, grannies, you name it. Everyone was there, dogs. Everyone was watching the football. Uh, what a performance. I watched the semi-final. I watched most of the tournament, but the semi-final against Sweden. Yeah. The way that they played at Bramall Lane in that second half and the skill and the goals that they scored, I yeah. don't know I think I've ever gone into a game against Germany thinking there's no other result but an England win. He got well, a little bit he got a little bit precarious when I thought, oh wait a minute, extra time penalties are on the way and it's gonna be a similar story, we lose on penalties. But I don't know, it just see it see, it reminded me, Phil, of yeah. England um, the men's team in the fifty over World Cup at Lords that it was just meant to be. Yeah. And it felt on Sunday at Wembley, it was just meant to be. And uh, and I tell you what, the interviews afterwards and, and the, they were fantastic. Yeah, what exactly. a laugh! And when they yeah. when they came in the press conference thing and it's coming home, yeah. and then they arrived in Fargo Square completely smashed. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go and watch them a lot. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I I watched it with my t- my two girls. They're they're eleven and thirteen, and they. Absolutely loved it. I'm always trying to get them into sport and with mixed results, but they absolutely loved it. They're desperate for me to take them to a to a football match now. Uh, Chloe Kelly's their favourite, um, and they 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 were on the edge of their seats. They they get what sport's about. The the, the um, there's a, a local camp um, near where I live that has um, uh, football all day. And be, uh, before the final, I think there was three, um, I think it was for the ages of about seven to 12, there were three girls that turned up to participate. On Monday after the final, 89 girls arrived. 
There you go. Really can. 89. So that's what Sunday did for, for, for women's football. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's just it's 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 the power of success, just the way they went about it. I just, I just loved it. I thought they were the smiles, there was passion, there was everything. It was, it was and, and also the crowd as well. The crowd looked really great as well, and they was enjoying themselves. It was a wonderful day. Well done, the lionesses. Yes, well, back back to the cricket because uh, we didn't miss much in the uh, the T Twenty at um, at Southampton. England thrashed, frankly, by uh, by ninety runs. We were sympathetic to Josh, Josh Butler last week. Um, said he'd been dealt a difficult hand, especially with the scheduling for his uh, start as life as England captain. But another series defeat, South Africa, it means uh, that it's the third T20 series defeat in a row. West Indies, India, and now South Africa. With the World Cup just around the corner, how are they going to um, get back into form? Well, I mean, Matthew Mott's come out and said there's a, it's a line in the sand moment, hasn't it? You know, he said, right, we've got to start trying to, you know, get better, start address some of these things. We just can't keep sort of bumbling along saying that we've got these great guys and what have you. There seems to be something that's not quite happening or not going quite according to plan. So uh, for him to come out and actually say that, obviously, it's a little bit concerning, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I think with the whiteboard team, they've got to be very, very careful that they don't just sit where they are because, you know, I, I think other teams around the world, you look at South Africa now, they're a strong team. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got players within that route, Riley Rousseau back in there, this Tristan Stubbs, this young kid, can Amazing. smack it mild. So I think what England did in whiteboard cricket for many years has almost sent the message to the rest of the world is they're the style of cricket and the style of play that you require. And England, let's be honest, are not playing to the standard that they've set themselves. You know, they've dipped below those standards and these other teams are coming through. They've got to be very, very careful. If they get to the standards that we've seen over the last few years, they'll be very, very competitive. Absolutely, they will. But, you know, as we've seen in the last few weeks and in particular last few series, that their standards have not quite been up to the, the high standards that they've set and teams are getting better. You know, there's more depth in some of these teams. There's more power. Um, you know, it's not just the batting, the batting's not been firing. I have concerns about the bowling. I just don't see that they've got much in terms of mystery or wow factor. If the ball swings around, the left arms are a big, big threat. But um, I, I, I worry if the ball's not moving around. And particularly in the T20 World Cup in Australia, I don't think it'll swing that much. No. Nope. You know, the pitch is be pure and it will rely on obviously your power of your batting, your feeling of it, but, you know, the skill levels of your ball, the bowling. Um, yeah, other teams are getting better and England have dipped their standards and that's why they've lost a few. Yeah, I mean, as you said, it is the batting and the bowling. It was the fourth time in six T20s this summer that England have been bowled out, but they were chasing huge totals. So it's it's both sides of the game that uh, seem to be letting them down. They're just not firing up top, like Sir Jason Roy, Josh Butler are kind of. There's these flashes up top, isn't there? That this is going to be, this is going to be the time where sort of like things are going to turn around, and then, and then we're losing too many wickets in clusters. I think you've almost got to sometimes strip it back to basics, even though that you know this this England white ball is such a well oiled machine now. You know, with such a great depth of really fantastic players, as we said earlier, I think Matthew Mott is just going to say, right, we can't keep living in the past. We have now just got to start almost again from scratch. Do you know what I mean? Just to then try and get that own identity about this side. I keep seeing pictures of Josh Butler sitting next to uh, Matthew Mott on the balcony and what have you, and and and, and he looks. He, he looks a bit lost, you know. He looks like he looks like he's frustrated. Looks like he's down. Um, and they they just need to somehow create this spark and get on a bit of a roll. It's interesting. In sports psychology plays a big part. If you take Ben Stokes out of that team, you know he's not yeah. played. He was there at the T Twenty World Cup. He's a huge presence on the field. You know, wherever yeah. he is, he's a presence. You know, Owen Morgan. Yeah, he, he, he's not the best fielder in the world, but he's good enough. But he's got a big presence out yeah. in the outfield. You know, I watch England in the field and you've got Liam Livingston on one side, you've got Johnny Bairstow on the other. You know, they're they're running the channels, if you like. But actually close to the batters, you know, I don't see much presence. I don't see much fear factor. Um, You know, it's something that Matthew, Mark, Joss Butler is going to have to work on. Um, It's just the standards. You know, standards in this modern era of sport, if you drop your standards by 10 or 15%, I'm sorry, you're going to get beaten. So they've got to somehow get their standards to those high standards 
and, it, and it's their own fault for setting them so high. They've <laughs> somehow got to get them back to that standard because if they do, they'll be competitive. If they don't, they've got no chance of winning the T20 World Cup. You, you, met, you mentioned Jason Roy there and you talked about presence. Um, I mean, he was one of those players that had a phenomenal presence. Not so much in the, well, a bit in the field, but really when he was walking out to bat, he was used to be walking out like a gunslinger, had real presence. That's gone. He doesn't, he doesn't have that swagger anymore. And he, he got just 17 in this last match. He's uh, managed just 76 in six games all summer. Do you think his place is now on the line? Yeah. Yeah. And he'll know that, but I wouldn't drop him yet. <laughs> I just think he's too good a threat that if he gets his form back, um, he's a match winner. You, you could actually argue that England won the T, um, the 50 over World Cup because Jason Roy got back fit and got back in the top of the order and caused chaos with Johnny Bear. So he's that good a player. Um, yeah, he'll know. He'll know if two or three more low scores uh, in Pakistan and there'll be more and more pressure built on him. It's a big 100. I mean, the 100 starts this week. I think it's big for the likes of Jason Roy to go and show his worth proof for everyone and, and show everyone how good he is. Uh, he's an outstanding player and a, a really quality person. So, um, you know, I'd be amazed if he doesn't find form again for the T20 World Cup, but he will need a few scores soon. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, Mike, that a lot of these sides now have caught up with England. They know the style of play. They know the people they're dealing with. And, and um, you know, they, they know how to slightly counter counter counteract that now. And so perhaps some of these guys are going to have to reinvent themselves a little bit, perhaps, in T20 cricket. Perhaps, you know, a different style, a slightly different kind of shot kind of decision and things. Because a couple of the times they have been out thought what I've seen. You know, they've sort of gone, right, he likes to play this. Here he comes and there's the ball, perhaps. So, you know what I mean? That, that, can, that can deceive them. So perhaps they're just going to have to re, just have a little re-look at themselves as individuals and about how they go about their sort of T20 game. It's not just going out there and trying to smash every ball for six because the bowlers have caught up a little bit with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I fear for them, you know, and, and, you know, those at the top of the order, you know, have been told, you know, and rightly so in the, in the power play, you've got to be aggressive, you've got to make sure you try and get your team off to a flight. With that comes high, high risk. You know, yeah. your job in T20 cricket as an opening is to play high risk cricket. And with high risk cricket, I can only imagine when it's going really well, you feel that you can hit the ball to any part. So when it's not quite going with you, that ball that, you know, comes off the outside edge, goes to hand, someone takes a flying catch. There's been a little bit more movement this year in white ball cricket than we've seen in the past. So playing that brand against the moving balls a lot harder. Um, I, I reckon it's it, it's it's a game in Test cricket. If you're out of form, you just say, you know, I'll just bat an hour and just give myself a chance. In T20 cricket, it doesn't allow you that freedom to just bat 20 balls. You've still got to go for it. You've still got to play high risk cricket, and it's it's inevitable that look, there comes a time when things don't quite go your way. Uh, but for Jason Roy, um, it, he'll need it to start going his way a little, a little bit quicker than I, I, I've not heard from him, from whispers from the camp or people within the camp that his place is under threat. But for him personally, he'll need a few scores in the hundred to give his uh, confidence a bit of a boost. Uh, and do you imagine that the the starting eleven is going to look a lot like the starting eleven uh, for the South Africa side in the World Cup? Because presumably there's not much time, so the play, these players are going to have to figure it out rather than them being wholesale changes. Oh, I, I think Ben, the hundred's going to be um, a shot window for players. Mm. You know, so if Phil Salt suddenly starts smacking it to all parts and gets a couple of hundreds, um, you know, I think England would potentially make the change. But it gives Jason Roy an opportunity. It gives other players. Liam Livingstone's not fired that much. You no. know, it, we're used to him firing. Um, so there's number Marin Ali was fantastic. Uh, Butler himself, the skipper, he needs a big score or two. So I think the hundred for, for for that reason puts a little bit more pressure and focus on the individuals within the England camp because, as Matthew Mott has stated, anyone that has an incredible hundred will potentially put themselves in the shot window for that Pakistan tour, which potentially gets you into a T20 World Cup. So uh, it makes the hundred a, a bit more dramatic in terms of selection going forward. 
Yeah, and, 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 and as we know, it, it's great to have competition for places. It's as simple as that. When people do realise that they're just going to be in that place and, you know, I'm a World Cup winner and everything, sometimes it's just inevitable that you just go off the boil a little bit and then all of a sudden a few whispers start going around that one of these guys might not be playing or might be looking to get dropped or there might be a space in the side for someone else coming in after a great hundred or something. It just ups the, ups the ante, doesn't it, and ups the tempo and everything everyone gets back on it so hopefully that will be what happens with this England T20 side So we are extremely excited to be joined this week by Sophia Dunkley England women's superstar batter Sophia thank you very much for taking time to chat with us uh, I understand you're in camp uh, up at uh, Birmingham for the Commonwealth Games how are you guys approaching it are you um, viewing it as just another tournament or is there inevitably added buzz because of all the other events and the opportunity to play for a place on the podium and a medal. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think, yeah, well, we had the opening ceremony last night and it was pretty mad, to be honest, because um, obviously it's home games and we kind of came out last. We got a massive applause and there's fireworks and all sorts going on, music. Um, and I think before, yeah, before last night, we probably all just, we hadn't really taken it all in because we literally just come off the back of playing South Africa in a series and we kind of just like, oh, it's another few games. But I think kind of coming here, settling in and seeing all the athletes and here it's kind of kicked in how big it is and how special it is. So yeah, last night definitely did that for us. So I think it's very new for us and very exciting. Um, but yeah, I think we're just, it's going to hit us when we get on the pitch, I reckon. <laughs> Uh, Sophia, uh, thank you so much for joining the, the pod. What you will receive is a cricket club cap. Oh. We have a very special, uh, like, bag. I, I, I don't say the baggy green, <laughs> but they're, they're baggy uh, kind of blue and red caps. So you'll get one uh, for joining the podcast. How um, exciting. How, how much have you, uh, as a group of uh, women, taken a huge amount of heart and, and, and kind of, um, the exposure the football team are getting. I mean, I, I've never, you know, in my time, sat with my two girls and been so <laughs> excited about the football, dancing around the kitchen, celebrating the goals. How are you girls kind of looking at the, the, the women's team going, wait a minute, that, that's fantastic, what they're achieving. We, we can have a piece of that in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, we're absolutely loving it and, and loving watching the games. And, and like you say, it's amazing to see all the noise about the football and everyone in the ground supporting and and after all the games, what I see on my social media is all about the football. And yeah, I think it's really, really special. And and yeah, I think to see um, all the athletes last night, to see people in the stands watching, you know, we're trying to get tickets for our families and it seems to be like sold out for loads of the games. And yeah, so we're we're really excited to see what the next few weeks can bring. And, and hopefully it can bring a lot of exposure to T20 cricket because we're hoping that, that kind of through the Commonwealth Games, it's people are might not get tickets for cricket because they like cricket just because it's kind of another event. So hopefully that attracts a bit few more people. But yeah, hopefully it is something that's really exciting and, and we can follow the football, which would be amazing. Uh, and just 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 on the, the Commonwealth game, how are you going to stop Australia? They, <laughs> seem, they seem to be the dominating force at the minute in the women, women's game. What have you got up your sleeves that you can stop them in the tournament? <laughs> yeah, I think they've definitely got the better of us the last few years. But I think... The last few weeks, we've played a really like exciting new T20 squad. We've got a lot of youngsters in there and we really kind of changed the way we play and just make our batting order a little bit more flexible and just going a lot harder. So I think we're coming a bit more aggressive and, uh, you know, we've got the likes of Alice Capsey, who's 17 and very, very talented. Um, Fred Kemp's been playing and, yeah, I think the kind of the way we're looking at the minute, we're looking a little bit newer and fresher. Hopefully that can bring it to them. Um, I, I've got to ask you about Alice. Um, I, I, I don't like to say I've got favourites, but she is my <laughs> favourite. Uh, how she settled in? She's such a, a dynamic player, isn't she? Yeah, she's settled in amazing. And I think one thing that's really special about her is like you just wouldn't know what her age is. She's so mature when she bats. She's kind of fearless. And uh, she went in the other day. I think she, she went in at three in the power play and got twenty five off about fifteen balls, just whacking it everywhere and didn't seem phased at all. And, after at the end of the game, I was like, oh, how were you nervous then? She was like, oh, yeah, I was really nervous. I was like, well, you look like you've been playing for about 15 years. So don't worry about it. But, yeah, she's she's such a special talent and it's great to have her in the team. And I think, yeah, she's going to really help us going forward and, and be a match winner for us, for sure. Has there been a real sort of youth policy? Because it seems that there are quite a lot of younger players coming in at the moment. You mentioned Freya Kemp, Alice Capti. Um, Izzy Wong is only 20. 
Does it feel like you've got a good blend of youth and experience in the squad? Yeah, massively. I think um, a lot of girls now have just been kind of uh, rewarded for what they've done at domestic cricket. So I think it's just the people that have stood up and, and shown what they can do and kind of excited um, our coaches, I guess. So yeah, it's great, it's great to have some young faces in and, and a mixture of really experienced and old and, well, not old, I want to say... <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably get told off for that now, but what I want to say is like some of the best players in the world, really, we've got in our They're, team. So you're old to us. You couldn't ask for better, really. <laughs> well, I'm getting old now if I say that, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, but it's just, it's just, we're just really lucky to have some of the best players in the world in our team, I think. And and people like Danny Wyatt, who who nearly is going to be the most capped T20 player in the world. So couldn't really ask for better than that. Uh, Sophia, you mentioned a new dynamic way of playing. Was that the coach that set that out, the captain? Or, you know, you as a group of players, did you sit down and say, come on, we've got to be a bit more aggressive, particularly with the batting hand? I think it was just kind of collectively. And, and although the World Cup wasn't um, 50, uh, it wasn't T20 cricket, sorry, it was 50 over. But I think kind of uh, the mindset we had going out of the ashes, um, probably for us was a little bit um, safe and we probably weren't in our best headspace then. So I think kind of, Coming out of the Ashes in the World Cup, we didn't we didn't play our best cricket, and and we just wanted to see how we could change that. And and for us, we've got the players to be aggressive, and we've got the players to to be match winners and take the games away from a lot of the opposition. So I think it's just tuning into that a bit more and and being brave and not worrying about um almost the consequence of getting out. Just just yeah, trying to take it to the opposition as much as we can. And you've obviously been uh, promoted up the uh, the order you're opening now. Is that part of the more aggressive mentality? And is that what you have been asked to bring at the, the top of the order? Yeah, I think that the way that I naturally play is quite aggressive and I, and I like to hit the ball. And I think I can, you know, make the most of the power play, hopefully just batting how I am and not, not changing too much. Um, but yeah, I definitely think hopefully that is going to work towards us um, kind of kicking on in T20. and. Yeah, it's probably not going to happen overnight, but hopefully uh, the more I do it, the more I can get that experience. Um, but I've batted three in, in the 100 tournaments and things. So, yeah, um, hopefully, yeah, it'll go all right. <laughs> We've had uh, Ravi Shastri on the podcast recently um, talking about, you know, the, the bilateral men's series potentially might have to go to allow these leagues to um, have more of a showcase for all the different countries that have these franchise leagues. Uh, we've had Wazi Makram saying that 50 over cricket's going, it's pretty much dead <laughs> and he wants T20 cricket, test match mm-hmm. cricket. I look at the women and it's grown so much over the years but you don't play enough. How can we get more cricket for the women, more test matches? One test match against South Africa it was a four-day game. Um, could it be five-day cricket? Can we get more test match cricket for the women? Yeah, I think we'd all love to play, definitely play more cricket internationally and yeah, especially test matches. I think um, for us, we've had two in the last year, which seems quite a lot, which is mad really. But um, so we know it's almost like uh, I've only played three so far and I'm definitely learning on the job because we don't play any Red Bull cricket outside of international. Um, but I think it would be, yeah, it'd be amazing. I think the few test matches that we've played have really showcased some amazing cricket and some really exciting cricket, especially in the Ashes. So to have more of that, I think no doubt would be great for the game. Um, yeah, and I, mean, I know a lot of the girls would love that for sure. And what would be a reasonable amount? I mean, you've said you've played two in the last year. Surely you should be playing you know, six to eight test matches a year. That would be about the right number, wouldn't it, for, for the growth of the game? Yeah, I mean, it would be great to be playing, you know, every time we have a series against whoever comes over or when we go away. Um I mean, I've got, I'm not much brain, so I've got no idea how the schedule works or anything like that. But yeah, six to eight, that'd be great. Yeah, I know you went over to India to play for the, the Trailblazers. Yeah. How, how was that? And do you see, I mean, I know I keep hearing talk, I've, I've spoken to Sarah, Sarah of Ganguly about uh, a women's IPL. That'd be fantastic for the game, wouldn't it? If you could have your own showcase IPL. I know the 100 was spectacular last year. That starts next week. That's going to be another great event. But if you can get India to give, um, you know, a, a full and proper IPL for with, with auctions, I don't know how much you'd go for, Sophie, but I'm sure you'd get a bit <laughs> or two. Um, that'd be great for the game, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think women's IPL would be, yeah, amazing for the game. Like, uh, when I went over just for the, the tournament, just, um, which was, I don't know, two, three games long, it was just amazing to see kind of talent on show in India, like the, a lot of domestic girls that you probably would never have heard of and there were some amazing cricketers out there. So I think having that in India, um, a full tournament, would just 
yeah, I think it would just show off how much talent they have there and, and bring some amazing players to the front. And I think for the women's game, especially, I know how much they love their cricket over there. It would, yeah, I think it would like skyrocket the game. So yeah, fingers crossed that does happen. And yeah, I'm hopeful. Hopefully it will be soon. We've, we've mentioned the Australians. Um, it's all sort of inevitable in every conversation about cricket that we mentioned the Australians. <laughs> but after the Ashes, Alex Hartley wrote that the uh, Australian domestic setup is four or five years ahead of the English game. Do you think that sort of more English women taking places, uh, taking part in international competitions like it, perhaps a, an IPL, might help accelerate the development of the game and allow us to sort of catch up with the Australians? Yeah, I think for us, I think the domestic structure is, is you know, it's we kind of only just started lifting it off a couple of years ago, and I think it's going really well, and and it's showing how we can uncover these talented youngsters that we've got, and and lots of other people that have played for England in the last few years. Um, but I think yeah, going and get experience at other competitions is also as as valuable and, and especially T20 when we've got a T20 World Cup coming up um, so yeah definitely and and I think these opportunities are great um, but yeah I definitely think our domestic structure is, is on the way and, it, and it's been amazing for us so far so we're, we're really grateful for that and, and all the work they've put in for that uh, Sophia I, I, mean, I did ask you and, uh, how much are you worth in the IPL? How much are you worth in the IPL? For? <laughs> That's a great question <laughs> oh I want to know well <laughs> I'd always get um <laughs> I always love watching it and, and I find it, you know, when they when they put the name up and there's just like just no one says anything and I'm thinking, Oh <laughs> no imagine imagine if you just sat on the sofa at home watching this and you're like, Oh well <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it must be I have never asked players that it must be so nervous. It must be nervous it must be. <laughs> when your name gets put up and the paddles don't start to yeah. <laughs> Paddles go up, you think, oh. You've got to watch it on your own, I reckon. You've got to watch it on your own, just in case. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. What you don't know, on this podcast, we we have an eight-year-old girl called Megan, who's going to cricket. Um, She's become a bit of a diva. She's gone on holiday, so she generally sends her uh, question through. (laughs) She hasn't recorded it this week because she's on holiday. (laughs) I've had a message from her, and she said... Uh, her question to you is, who are your heroes and who do you as- ins- uh, aspire to try and play like? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so my heroes, I'd say growing up, I played with a player called Beth Morgan who played for Middlesex and for England. And she was my coach when I played for Middlesex and also played alongside her. And she was just as a person, probably most one of the most selfless people I've ever met and, and a great team player. And she played amazing well for Middlesex for many, many years. Um, so, yeah, she's definitely one of my heroes. I think my other one, probably, I don't know, I'll say at the minute, I'll say Catherine Brunt is up there because she, I mean, I'm sure you've watched the play before, but the way she plays is just, the, what the passion that she puts into it, the competitiveness, the fight that she shows is just, yeah, I can't can't describe it. Um I think the way that she's she's worn that England shirt for the last however many years has been, you know, it's been amazing to watch and and yeah, it's, it's a true honour to play alongside her. So yeah, I'd say Beth Morgan and Catherine Brunt I'm gonna go for today. Fantastic. I will let uh, well Megan listens, so she'll uh, she'll love that answer. Thank you for answering Megan's question. <laughs> You're uh, so also welcome. on the podcast. Um <laughs> we have a, a segment which is usually done by Phil. Oh yeah. Not here, and it's called the <laughs> the either or segment. And you okay. can only choose one of the two that I'm going to say to you. Okay. Right. So the first one is Ru- Rubik's Cube or Harry Potter films? Oh. Oh, I'm going to go Harry Potter films. But Harry- the other funny thing is with that one is when I was in quarantine in New Zealand, I learned how to do a, ru- a mini Rubik's Cube. And I also watched the Harry Potter films for the first time from the same trip. But I'm going to get Harry Potter because they're good. <laughs> did I did I see Izzy Wong on the bus doing a Rubik's cube? Oh yeah, Izzy Izzy Wong can do like mega Rubik's cubes, like even the the big ones. She's really good at that. Yeah, she did it quickly. I think it was mm. on um, Kate Cross's uh, Instagram story. I saw. Yeah, that. she does it. She does it. She's quick. Very talented. That. So which wasted more time in quarantine? <laughs> Rubik's took, took, cube took me a while, but. I watched Harry Potter film every night for I don't know how many days it was, 10 days. So <laughs> kept me occupied. <laughs> uh, yeah, the next one, uh, so it is uh, Lords or the Oval. Oh, that's a toughie. I'm gonna, I, I love playing at the Oval, so I'm going to have to go to the Oval. Better wicket. 
<laughs> yeah. More bounce. Uh, right, that's good. The oval. The next one, middle order or opening? Oh, glass opening now, aren't I? Opening. <laughs> opening, yeah, let's go for opening. Opening is a good one. Um, four day test or five day test? Five day, gotta be five day. Five day, there's a message to the administrators. <laughs> um, that final one, uh, the 100 or T20? Oh, we'll go with the 100. <laughs> Why? Great, come on. It's good. It's just fun and it goes quick, it's short. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like the, the modern player. You can end up just with a, a, a five. Ball. Yeah. <laughs> Couple of overs, that'll do. <laughs> Couple of overs. <moments. laughs> but with the 100, just how important is it for the women's game? Has it been for the women's game? Yeah, the 100 was, uh, it was just amazing last year. I think we were all so shocked to see how it, how it panned out because we obviously didn't know what to expect. But I think the crowds we got and the, the noise we got and yeah, the attention was amazing. I think from that we it really accelerated the game a lot. So yeah, it was it was massive and I think this year will be even better because we've got um yeah, I think you know, second year on, I'm sure more things will be happening and, and we've got um a lot more world class players coming over in the um overseas section as well. So yeah, just looking forward to it. But it was very special for us last year, definitely. And Sophia, just uh, just on the Commonwealth Games, um, is, is this a stepping stone to the Olympics? Do you think? Yeah, we were actually talking about that last night. But to be honest, yeah, hopefully. I mean, not that I know how any of these things work, but I think hopefully, if we, if we had a little bit of success here and it and it goes well, and and people like coming to watch us play, I guess hopefully it would be. How cool would that be? But yeah, I mean, don't know how you get things at the Olympics, but we'll we'll give it a go. <laughs> Does, um, so the, in, in the Olympics, they have. Um the Olympic Village for all the mm. athletes, where I, I've seen pictures of it and they have like massive McDonald's. <laughs> is, is that like that in the Commonwealth? <laughs> is there a Commonwealth Games Village for all There the is. There is a Commonwealth Games Village. We are actually staying not in, we're like five minutes away from the village because um, like, I don't know why, but cricket and beach volleyball in this hotel, but we have been to the village and it's, when I went back, it was kind of like going back to uni a bit because everyone's in halls Everyone's just like socialising on the grass, but there are some like great little food trucks and stuff, and it's all happening down there. But yeah, there is there is a Commonwealth Games village. And is it is it that you can mix with all the other athletes, and and, and will you get a chance to go and watch some of the the other events? Yeah, yeah, you can mix and chat to yeah whoever. So there's like a thing. Well, so there's this thing I'll show you on our accreditation that like you get like ten England badges. But everyone like swaps badges with all the other countries because they want to collect them. So like Amazing. last night at the opening ceremony, we were like with all the other teams. So that's the England one. Oh, that's the camera. It says part of the pride on it. Oh, and then yeah. you get like, nice. so my friend that plays Pakistan cricket, she gave me that one and I gave her a lion. And then you just, everyone just collects all these badges really. But it's a great conversation starter because you just get to chat to everyone. So um, how, many, how many badges do you get? So we get, I think you get 10 and then so you basically you can swap 10, but then some people are just give them out. So, you know, just crack on and get some. Can, so can, I, can I do a deal with you? For, for oh. when we do, uh, your baggy um, um, Vaughny and Suffers podcast, Cricket Club Cat. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we do a bit of an exchange for a couple it's, of badges? Oh, yeah. I can, yeah, I reserve you a couple of badges, no problem. Oh, love a badge. <laughs> nice love little pin. <laughs> yeah. Um, just make yeah. not an Australian one. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I've not got one of those yet. <laughs> not got one of those yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's very social. And I think, yeah, we can when we've got free time. I think there's a little section that athletes can go and watch other events, which would be cool. So lawn bowls starts today, so that'll be good. Lawn bowls, uh, finger or thumb? You know, oh. If, if you've played lawn bowls, where you, the thumb is it's just the way the, you shape the ball. Yeah. Or the ball, I, if you like, yeah. I've played, but I've definitely not been very good. But Danny Wyatt, she loves lawn bowls. She's is all there, over it. <laughs> is there anything Danny Wyatt's not good at? No, to be fair, that's a great question. Uh, she's good at putting a lot of things. To be fair, she, yeah, lawn, I think lawn bowls is, one of, is up there for her, to be fair. Well, she's that good at it. <laughs> she loves it. I tell you what, she, she, I mean, she, you did mention um, the, the, the older people in the squad. She's <laughs> one of the older people. She could actually go into lawn bowls. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I reckon she'd love it. I reckon she'd love it, to be fair. 
I played, uh, played a few weeks ago. Uh, my partner was Sam Allardyce. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Random Tuesday afternoon in Berry. How'd you Lord get on? Uh, we lost. We got um. <laughs> by two 75 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> Amadus completely, oh. completely schooled me on the, on the crown green. <laughs> so, brilliant talking to you, Sophia. Thank you very much for, for your time and, and massive good luck at the Commonwealth Games. Thank you very much and thanks for having me, guys. Right, great interview. I really enjoyed that. Didn't think that we would be talking about lawn bowls, though, I have to admit. And uh, I know, Mike, that you're a fan of the lawn bowls. Phil... <laughs> Do you, do, do you like to get out there and play a bowls? Yes, yeah. I don't mind a bit of bowls. Tony Alcock, Tony Alcock, David Bryant, they were my heroes. And listen, it's the only game that you can play while smoking a pipe. David Bryant used to smoke his pipe whilst playing for England. I don't know another sport where you can smoke. <laughs> Phil, the question on law the, on crown green balls. I mean, I've just been yes. watching it in the Commonwealth Games. Are you a finger or a thumb? Well, I, that's always been my trouble. I've never quite realised which one to go for. I, I, I'm a bit of a mix and matcher. I think I'm probably a thumber. Um, I tell you what, Sophia, what what a, what a fantastic, oh, brilliant, and I, and I like the style they've gone for in the the women's T20. More aggression. She gives it a right good throttle. Yeah, uh, it's risky, but that's the kind of cricket that you need to play to to win uh, World Cups. It's, it's Australia, isn't it? That they, they, they always seem to come up against this juggernaut of Australia. And it's yeah. how they're going to try and beat uh, the Australian side that'll be the key. And she mentioned the hundred there. Well, why wouldn't I mean? Why wouldn't they, why wouldn't the women cricketers love the hundred? I mean, fantastic crowds. It's starting up again shortly, isn't it? They must be absolutely buzzing for it. I mean, it's just such a fantastic competition. Um, for them, uh, there's going to be you know, it's a huge crowds going out there expressing themselves. And I think Sophia's going to really enjoy it. It's the second year. It has quite an act to follow this year because the blast was so good. Um, do you think they'll be able to build uh, on last year's competition? Well, it, it, I think in terms of ticket sales, um, I, I'm led to believe pretty much most games are sold yeah. out. So it, it certainly had an impact. Um, it'll have to do some to match the blast. This year's blast was fantastic. You know, you're hoping for good weather, uh, you're hoping for drama, uh, you need a few last ball finishes, uh, create a bit of, uh, I guess, social media presence. That's generally what happened you know, on the blast this year. There were so many tight games and so many incredible uh, victories from non, non-winning non positions. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It always creates debate. It, it's, it's a bit like voting, isn't it? People are either in or out, uh, you're either red or blue. You can't be in the middle. You can't. It doesn't seem to think, or many don't think you can like all formats of the game. Just enjoy that the hundreds arrived. It's going to be here for a long, long time. Just enjoy it. It's bat and ball, 22 yards, nothing really similar other than 20 balls. So just get out there and enjoy it. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be another... I, th- I think it will be able to build on it. As you said, well, it's certainly, as Michael was saying there, certainly the crowds are there. So they're saying that they want to see more of it. They're sold out uh, up and down the country. So uh, bring on the 100. Let's see what it serves up this summer. Um, and I, I, we talked last week about the IPL and how you know potentially it was taking over the world. I don't know if you saw this article by Tim Wigmore in The Telegraph. He was talking to one of the franchise owners and they were saying that they are thinking about and hoping to put players on, not doing it yet, but hoping to put players on 12-month contracts. Um, do you think that that is going to be the start of the sort of global domination of IPL? When you start talking IPL, it's IPL owners. Um, so the IPL will have their window in India. They might have a second, but you know what... Um, IPL franchise owners are doing are buying teams in the South African League and the Caribbean Premier League. But I've said for a long, long time, the ECB are mad if they don't try and get them to buy into the 100 ball teams. You know, and, and if you're the Mumbai Indians, so we, we mentioned Tristan Stubbs, the, the young South African batter. He's on a contract with the Mumbai Indians. You know, Daryl Brevis, who's not in the South African team, the 18 year old that uh, played for Mumbai this year, an incredible talent. Mumbai have signed him up. So, they're not silly. They'll be sending them to their franchise teams around the world to gain experience. Um, you look at football teams now. I think Man City now own 11 teams. 
You know, so globally, they want to have an operation where they can loan out players that are young coming through the system to one of their other clubs and then you bring them back to your main operation. Uh, and that's exactly what will happen in cricket. I mean, anyone that thinks it's not going to happen very, very soon is utterly bonkers because these franchise teams around the world are so rich, they're worth over a billion dollars um, and they're only going to get richer, bigger and they're going to buy more teams around the world and they're going to try and grab more players and have big groups of players that are on 12-month contracts and they decide where they're going to play. And if you're a player and you get offered to sign for the Mumbai Indians on a few million a year, you know, it's then down to the international game to do something about it. You know, I'm afraid you only have to look at the live, live floor in golf. Now, whether you agree or you don't, if you're a sports person or a golfer or a cricketer and someone's offering you five times the money that you earn at the minute, I think you're probably going to sign the contract. <laughs> it's your job to go and earn money playing that sport. So um, it, it's going to be around and without any question, coming soon will be 12-month uh, franchise contract. All right, we've got a new segment this week. So, Phil, I hope you're ready because we've given uh, listeners the opportunity to oh. ask toughers anything they want, anything at all. Can be can be about the world of cricket, but not necessarily. It could be about something else. Uh, we're calling it Free Hit. Uh, I don't know who's you, whether it's your bowling being hit or you've got to, you're, you're, you're facing a snorter of a delivery and you've got to, uh, you've got to try and put it in the stands. But uh, here, are our, here are some questions we've had from listeners for Phil Tufnell. Uh, so here's the first one, and this one is about cricket. Uh, it's from John, and he asks, would you have free hits for overstepping in test matches? And should leg side wides be scrapped in white ball cricket, giving batters the ability to hit 360 degrees? Uh, I don't think that it should be a free hit in test match cricket. I think that would be wrong. I think you've got to keep the real sort of essence and the, and the, and the purity of the game in test match cricket. So I don't agree with that. And I think then in ODI cricket, I think there should be more of a margin uh, for uh, down the leg side. I think that anything now that is down the leg side is given wide, isn't it? I think that there should be a little bit more of a margin because at the end of the day, as you say, you, you can you, you can hit the ball just as easy sometimes on the down the leg side as as, as round, on the off side. So I think there should be a bit of margin down the leg side given by the umpires. Why not? Okay, uh, so here's the next one, and this is from Dan. He said, if you had to bowl at Jeffrey Boycott all day, he was batting for a draw. Would you fake an yeah. injury and head off for a pint? Um, oh, oh, God! I've just pulled my hamstring. <laughs> oh, I've just got in the hammy <laughs> I've just got in the hamstring. <laughs> I'll try and get him out for half an hour and then go down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and third and final one, this is from Lewis. Uh, and he says, when you are in the commentary box, what goes through your mind and how do you prepare? Mm. Does anything go through your mind, Phil? What goes through my mind? Well, you're, you're, you're pretty busy looking at the game, to be honest with you. So you're sort of taking everything in. You're taking the whole picture of the ground in. You're taking, you're subconsciously sort of working out or pretending to be a captain, or I am actually in the commentary box, or the bowler, or the batsman. You're putting them, you're putting yourself in their shoes and trying to sort of like think and second guess what they'll be doing. So that's kind of what you're doing. I've Question: do you, do you ever wear double denim? Because I noticed you've got a <laughs> denim shirt. <laughs> I, I wear double denim quite a lot, Mike. I do, actually. That's a very, very good question because I sometimes worry about that because sometimes you take the mickey, don't you? But I know I've won, I've wore double denim and different coloured denims at different times as well. So I think it's a free-for-all in the denim world. A bit shaking Stevens like. <laughs> I've never treble denim <laughs> love a bit of double denim also known as the canadian tuxedo i believe uh excellent first round of questions for phil on free hit uh love that uh, for future segments if you want to send a question to phil either about cricket or whatever uh, is on your mind head over to the telegraph cricket on twitter uh, and get your questions in right that's about all we have time for today a big thank you to mike and phil a huge thanks to Sophia Dunkley once again for joining us. Best of luck to her and the rest of the England side at the Commonwealth Games. The three of us are back next Wednesday, same time, same place. 
We will be speaking with South African bowler Simon Harmer, who could very easily have been lining up for England rather than against them at the end of the month. So keep an eye out for that. There's lots of great stuff building up on the Vaughney and Tuppers Cricket Club channel to check out in the meantime, including interviews with the likes of Trent Bolt and Ravi Ashwin, among others. Thank you very much for listening to this episode and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date. Until next week, goodbye. Mm-hmm.